Amitav Ghosh was born in Calcutta and grew up in India, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and now lives between Calcutta and Brooklyn. You will find out the relevance of this later. And the author of 10 novels, he laid down the challenge facing storytellers in his 2016 polemic, The Great Derangement, Climate Change and the Unthinkable, and went on to answer his own clarion call with 2019's Gun Island. In the two years since, he has turned to parable and non-fiction. His most recent publication is Jungle Nama, an adaptation of a legend from the Sundarban, with artwork by Salman Tour. His new book, The Nutmeg's Curse, Parables, or A Planet in Crisis, which is out imminently, is a work of non-fiction which sets our current crisis in its historical context. Welcome, Amitav. Hello, Claire. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Um, I want to get straight down to um, the great derangement. Just give us the what you what you said in that 2016 pamphlet, really, which was so important in this debate. Well, you know, I feel uh, a little bit uh, sort of uh, discombobulated when I hear that it's a sort of call to arms or a uh, you know or a polemic or anything, because they're actually it's really more a kind of introspection. I was trying to sort of ask myself. Why is it that I, in my own practice, have been have found it so hard to write about climate events and the climate crisis? And what is it about the form of the novel as such uh, that really resists, uh, you know, something like uh, the climate crisis? So, you know, I point to various aspects, uh, you know, of the form uh, that make it very difficult to deal with, uh, you know, matters like uh, extremely improbable events. And as we know now, <laughs> all these events that are sort of uh, coming at us so fast and furious, uh, they're all extremely improbable. I mean, the scientists keep saying that, uh, you know, there's a, a one in a thousand year chance of such a flood or of, uh, you know, such a hurricane or, or such a drought and so on. And yet they're happening all around us all the time. You, you say in The Great Derangement that uh, I have come to recognise that the challenges that ch climate change poses for the contemporary writer, although specific in some respects, also are also products of something broader and older, that they derive ultimately from the grid of literary forms and conventions that came to shape the narrative imagination in precisely that period when the accumulation of carbon in the atmosphere was rewriting the destiny of the earth. That is a ringing, a ringing paragraph, Amitav. Well, yes, because I think it's actually really since the, uh, you might say the 1970s onwards, but most of all from the 1990s onwards, that really fiction has come to have a sort of exclusive focus uh, on, um, you know, on people's emotions, their thoughts, their uh, states of mind, uh, their identities and so on. Because, uh, you know, even in the 60s, uh, Steinbeck uh, was writing a book like uh, The Grapes of Wrath, you know, which was uh, uh, in many ways uh, really uh, a book about climate. I mean, the first, uh, the first chapter of The Grapes of Wrath is very much uh, um, about uh, climate issues. And I think in many ways, you know, the book uh, really deals uh, it's very contemporary. I mean, it deals with migration. It deals with this kind of people being displaced by uh, this uh, this this terrible uh, change in climate. So, you uh, two of the themes you you mention um, is the is the ability of the novel to deal with the non-human, and also the ability of the novel to deal with the uncanny, with coincidence, which seems the the the, the events which seem beyond our imagination. Can you just uh, explain? those two things? Well, <clears throat> you know, the novel has a long tradition of dealing with uh, the uncanny, you know, and the uncanny is very much uh, the realm uh, that we are in. I mean, so many of these events nowadays are, are profoundly uncanny, you know. They suddenly arrive in the middle of, uh, you know, I was just uh, the day before yesterday in Houston, Texas, about to deliver a lecture on um, on climate events and the uncanny and what should happen. But a hurricane had exploded uh, over us at just that time. I mean, these things are just constantly occurring. I mean, you know, there's a section in Gun Island uh, about a wildfire uh, approaching um, a museum uh, in uh, in Los Angeles. 
And that did happen. The Getty Museum had a wildfire coming right at it. But I wrote that part uh, six months before it happened. <laughs> you know, so I mean, one just constantly uh, encounters these sort of weird and improbable uh, events. And of course, uh, fiction has historically been able to deal with many uh, uh, uncanny events of this kind. Uh, you know, there's, uh, I don't know if you, if you remember the work of Algernon Blackwood, a Canadian uh, British writer who wrote wonderful uh, uh, stories of the uncanny and so on. But, uh, you know, the problem is that, uh, you know, that tradition of writing is really regarded as marginal, as a genre, as a kind of, you know, fantasy or horror or something. Uh, and we see now that uh, it's not at all fantastical. It's not at all unlikely. It's just happening all around us all the time. So, so in, a yes. way, in a way, what you're talking about is a problem for the literary novelist, because you make the point in The Great Derangement that science fiction writers and fantasy writers and in media other than the novel have been dealing with this and with also with the non-human for, for decades. You know, we could talk about um, Terry Pratchett's Discworld. We could talk about um, um, the, the um, Watership, Watership the universe. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, yes, that's absolutely true. Uh, you know, uh, um, it is, I mean, the problem really is not so much about what writers do, but rather the literary ecosystem as a whole. Uh, you know, I mean, the writer who writes about those things, I mean, like Algernon Blackwood, if you like, or Richard Adams in writing Watership Down and so on, uh, they're regarded as, uh, you know, fantastical books, they're regarded as uh, something completely extraneous to serious literature. But, you know, here, uh, Claire, the, that's one of the strange things. If I think back on the books that were considered a serious literature, you know, uh, 50, 60 years ago, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, who were the very serious writers? I mean, Angus Wilson, maybe Iris Murdoch and so on. Uh, and, uh, you, know, you know, nobody reads Angus Wilson today. I think I can say that with, uh, with a fair degree of certainty. They just don't. Whereas the, the, the writers from that period who are really remembered and read all the time now uh, are writers like Arthur C. Clarke. You know, there's a huge sort of Algon and Blackwood revival, for example. There's an H.P. Lovecraft revival. Uh, Ursula Le Guin, I mean, you know, her work, uh, she was throughout her life sort of uh, categorized and marginalized as a, as a science fiction writer. But, you know, when she died a couple of years ago, there was just this huge outpouring uh, of, of love for her, you know, and a sort of incredible excitement of discovery. Octavia Butler is another person who comes to mind. So, in, terms you know, the, in terms of the um, um, what has changed in those in the establishment writers that you're talking about, you you have sort of noticed a, a change in 2018, just before yeah. Gun Island. What was it? This change. Uh, that's an interesting. Uh, that's an interesting question. I think 2018 really was a pivotal year. You know, I think uh, that was when these climate events became impossible to ignore. As indeed they are today. I mean, nobody, nobody really sort of tries to pretend that these weird things aren't happening. And I think that had a part to do with it. Then there was uh, Greta Thunberg and uh, many other young uh, youth groups sort of springing up. And also in the literary world, there was a real change. I think um, uh, Richard Powers's uh, Overstory was published that year. Uh, and it, uh, you know, far from being marginalized, it was celebrated by the literary community. It was, uh, you know, up for the booker and so on. Quite rightly, it's a completely wonderful book. And that is telling the story of, uh, it's, it's reinventing the novel from the point of view of the tree. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, there you are. I mean, I think there was a real change. And, uh, you know, now I can't even tell you. I mean, I keep, I get like two or three manuscripts a day. Uh, you know, arriving through my public website. Uh, and, uh, you know, they often begin by saying, you know, we read your book, The Great Derangement, and it made us want to do this, um, you know, this kind of writing. And so now uh, uh, you have to read our, you have to read our manuscript. And of course, I would love to read all those manuscripts, but it's not possible, you know, I couldn't possibly keep up. So um, you have since um, the Gun Island, which was now published two years ago, you you have um, turned to um, Fable, 
or parable, I suppose. I, I said parable, but I think it's more fable in Jungle Nama, which is 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 retelling a, a traditional story of a sort of ecological fable, really, from the Sundarbans, isn't it? And then, and now your next book is a history of colonialism, and the very one of your points is that it's this this change is all tied up with our colonial history and our history of exploitation of people and of resources. Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, a jungle nama followed really in a way from the great derangement because in the great derangement, I make the uh, I make the argument that we have to look for other forms, uh, you know, uh, perhaps new collaborative forms. And for me, it was incredibly exciting to work with uh, uh, Salman Tour, whose whose work is just absolutely fabulous. And uh, uh, you know, an audio and a performed version is going to be out very very soon. And uh, I hope uh, you get to hear it. It's, uh, I think it's just fantastic. Uh, it's uh, performed by Ali Sethi, uh, who's a very gifted young singer. And this is, uh, a, this is a, a fable which gives, which, which puts the natural world in charge and has its, its um, protagonists a, a sort of tigers. And uh, yes. <laughs> you can explain a little bit about it. Yes, well, it's an adaptation of a legend from the Sundarban, which is the world's largest mangrove forest. Uh, and it's really a legend about uh, how human beings are, create a balance between their needs and the needs of other beings, you know, of all kinds, uh, tigers and uh, um, crocodiles and all sorts of other beings. I think it's a wonderful story simply because it speaks of, uh, you know, finding a balance. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so it was a very exciting story to work with. Now, uh, you know, I've got this book, The Nutmeg's Curse, coming out. By the way, have you received a copy yet? I haven't. I, oh. I, I, I look forward to it, but I haven't yet. <laughs> well, that's terrible. I must get Jocasta to send you a copy uh, <laughs> immediately. Uh, yes. So, uh, you know, uh, I think in so many ways, when we talk about the climate crisis, when we talk about, uh, you know, the so-called Anthropocene and so on, we tend to see it as a problem oriented towards the future. Whereas to me, it's, it seems perfectly evident that uh, it's in fact a problem of history. Uh, it's a problem completely rooted in history and especially in colonial history, in the expropriation of resources in the expropriation and indeed extermination uh, of uh, you know, many groups of people by European colonists going back to the 17th century. I think in so many ways, we are really reliving the 17th century, which was also a time of enormous climatic disruption. Now, I want to just finish by asking you to read from Gun Island, a, 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 a particular passage which brings together two of the themes. One of the themes is about how we blame the little guys in the boat trying to get away from the places of maximum devastation. And the other is about this uncanny, these uncanny events that we're all seeing in our everyday life as told in a, in a fictional form. Um, so uh, please, please, would you read that, that, those two passages? Of course, it would be a great pleasure. I saw now why the angry young men on the boats around us were so afraid of that derelict refugee boat. That tiny vessel represented the upending of a centuries old project that had been essential to the shaping of Europe. Beginning with the early days of chattel slavery, the European imperial powers had launched upon the greatest and most cruel experiment in planetary remaking that history has ever known. In the service of commerce, they had transported people between continents on an almost unimaginable scale, ultimately changing the demographic profile of the entire planet. But even as they were repopulating other continents, they had always tried to preserve the whiteness of their own metropolitan territories in Europe. This entire project had now been upended. The systems and technologies that had made those massive demographic interventions possible, ranging from armaments to the control of information, had now achieved escape velocity. They were no longer under anyone's control. This was why those angry young men were so afraid of that little blue fishing boat. Through the prism of this vessel, they could glimpse the unraveling of a centuries old project that had conferred vast privilege on them in relation to the rest of their world. In their hearts, they knew that their privileges could no longer be assured by the people and institutions they had once trusted to provide for them. The world had changed too much, too fast. 
The systems that were in control now did not obey any human master. They followed their own imperatives, inscrutable as demons. Suddenly, Lubna came rushing over, her face flushed, her eyes shining in exhilaration. What's that over there, she said. I spun around to see a darkening smudge spreading across the southern horizon. Maybe it's a cloud, I said. No, that can't be it, said Chinta. There's something different about the way it's moving. It seems to be coming towards us. The smudge was growing quickly, spilling over the horizon like a stain, expanding rapidly in our direction. I could only gape uncomprehendingly. What on earth could it be? Then suddenly, Pia was beside me. Snatching her field glasses out of my hands, she focused them on the horizon. Birds, she said. They're birds, hundreds of thousands of them. No, millions. They must be migrating northwards. They're going to pass right over us. Rafi too had appeared beside us now. Gazing at the sky, he said, it ju it's just as it says in the story, the creatures of the sky and sea rising up. An awestruck silence descended on us as the dark mass came arrowing through the sky. It was as if some limb of the earth had risen into the heavens and were reaching out to touch us. Everything seemed to stand still, even the air. I felt that I had somehow ceased to breathe. Time itself is in ecstasy, said Chinta softly. I had never thought I would witness this joy with my own eyes, pouring over the horizon. And then there they were, millions of birds circling above us, while below, in the waters around the blue boat, schools of dolphins somersaulted, and whales slapped their tails on the waves. Un stormo, said Chinta, gazing upwards, using the Italian word for a flock of birds in flight. And it seemed to me that this was indeed the right word, the only word for the phenomenon that we were witnessing, a storm of living, th living beings, bhutas. So Amtav, it's a pleasure as always to talk to you. Uh, you. You've become one of my benchmarks in in a whole area of thinking that I have to say has opened up since we met. It, it, I mean, it was post the, the Great Derangement. We met at Hay on Wai. And, uh, yes, that's right. I look forward to the next novel. I hope you're not going to forsake it entirely for nonfiction no. and, and, and fable. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> I love writing novels and, uh, you know, thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.